chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Administrator Milgram, uh, we want to welcome you to the uh, Commerce Justice Science Related Agency Subcommittee today to testify regarding the Drug Enforcement Administration's fiscal year 2025 budget request. On a personal note, I want to thank you for your attendance earlier this year at the annual uh, Prescription Drug Summit in Atlanta. Uh, your passion for the efforts to combat the uh, drug epidemic is commendable. And your presence at the summit was greatly appreciated and understood. Before we delve into the specifics of the budget request, I want to address a broader theme that has emerged in our examination of the DEA's uh, operations. While the mission of the DEA remains crucial and the commitment of Administrator Milgram appears sincere, it is evident that the support the agency receives from both the Department of Justice and this administration in general is lacking. <clears throat> Recent remarks by the Attorney General and the FBI Director regarding our law enforcement relationship with key partners have raised concerns. Three weeks ago, when discussing law enforcement cooperation with Mexico, the FBI director testified, quote, I'm pleased with what we've gotten, but we need a lot more, end of quote. That's the FBI director. When the DEA encounters obstacles such as <coughs> difficulties in securing visas in a timely manner for agents to operate in Mexico, and there are outstanding warrants that the Mexican government fails to act upon. It suggests that the state of our relationship with Mexico may be far from ideal. Additionally, it's troubling that the DEA administrator, despite her efforts, has not been able to secure a single meeting with a Mexican government official since assuming her position. This lack of engagement, the nonsensical bureaucratic delay in approving visas and blatantly ignoring extradition requests for cartel members should be far from pleasing for anyone who cares about our efforts to combat the cartels. Furthermore, Despite this administration's announcement in November 23 that it has secured China's cooperation to take steps to curtail the transit of fentanyl precursor chemicals, tangible progress in this regard seems to be lacking and more work remains to be done. In fiscal year 24, our subcommittee was faced with a challenging allocation which required significant cuts to many critical agencies' budgets. Despite this, the DEA was the only law enforcement agency to receive an increase in funding, the only one. I believe this speaks to our commitment to the mission of the DEA and our hopes for your success. Notably, the largest increase in the DEA's fiscal 25 budget request is for the expansion of the DEA's counter threat targeting teams. While this expansion is commendable, we must ensure that these investments yield measurable results and that includes by and from the Department of Justice. The Attorney General's testimony before this subcommittee two weeks ago highlighted a concerning sentiment regarding the DEA's role in combating the, the fentanyl crisis. When describing the whole of government approach 
this administration is taking to uh, combat fentanyl, the Attorney General noted Treasury's role in sanctions, Homeland's role in border security, the FBI's role in investigating cartels, the Marshal's role in securing fugitives, and then said, quote, the DEA has, at the very end of the line, a public affairs campaign. The perception that the DEA's role is limited to an education campaign undermines the agency's vital enforcement efforts. Nevertheless, we continue to believe in the mission of the DEA and recognize its importance in the war on drugs. Ambassador Milgram, we look forward to hearing from you today about the DEA's plans for fiscal 25 and how the agency intends to address the challenges we've discussed here. I'm especially interested in hearing your frank and honest assessment of our law enforcement relationship with Mexico, your agency's assessment of any progress in stopping Chinese precursor chemicals, and whether the DEA is truly receiving the support it needs from this administration. Thank you for being here. Uh, you, uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Let me recognize Mr. Cartwright for any remarks he may care to make. Thank you, Chairman Rogers. And Chairman Rogers, I join you in welcoming back Administrator Milgram <laughs> Uh, for her second appearance before this subcommittee uh, while we discuss the uh, fiscal year 2025 President's budget request. First, I'd, I'd, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the tragic loss of our brothers and sisters of the Department of Justice uh, last week when Deputy U.S. Marshal Thomas M. Weeks and three members of a Marshal's Fugitive Task Force lost their lives. It is a stark reminder of the risks and threats our federal law enforcement and their partners face every day and the ultimate sacrifice too many have had to make in the name of keeping our nation safe. I'd also like to convey my deepest sympathies to their families, friends, and colleagues. Administrator Milgram, last year we focused on how the types of drugs on our streets have dramatically shifted from plant-based narcotics such as cocaine and heroin to those made in laboratories that require no growing season. The accessibility and affordability of these synthetic drugs leaves DEA and its federal, state, and local partners in a continuous defensive posture to keep dangerous narcotics out of our communities and to combat the drug trafficking networks who are trying to put them there. It's estimated by the CDC that in the last year, we have lost over 112,000 souls to fentanyl overdo overdoses and poisonings. DEA is in many ways the last line of defense we have to save American lives against this ep epidemic. So I look forward to discussing with you today what DEA has done over the last year to identify and dismantle the entire network and what investments and, uh, uh, and, and other tools are most important to you in your fiscal year 2025 budget to continue this important work. I also look forward to hearing how the work you're doing on the international stage further enhances your ability to prevent these dangerous drugs from ever entering our country. We have already heard from both uh, FBI Director Ray and Attorney General Merrick Garland this year about the Mexican gov government, and uh, the chairman touched on this, how the Mexican government can be doing more to help us in this fight. We know the precursor chemicals are largely being imported into Mexico from the People's Republic of China. We know the Mexican cartels are utilizing their decades old business models rapidly to produce fentanyl and distribute it. We know they're exploiting their existing drug trafficking routes to smuggle millions of dollars worth of fentanyl pills into our country. 
We need Mexico to be a partner in this fight. So I look forward to discussing that more with you here today. <clears throat> I want to say ultimately all of DEA's work relies heavily on Congress to provide the resources needed to address the existing and emerging challenges in combating drug trafficking operations. A continued investment in DEA sends a clear signal to our adversaries on the global stage that we will not allow this attack on our communities to continue without consequence and that those responsible will be held accountable by our justice system. Administrator Milgram, I want to applaud the work of the men and the women of the DEA and I look forward to working with you on how we can best invest in this agency in FY 2025. So once again, thanks for being here. Welcome back. <coughs> and I look forward to your testimony. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Administrator Milgram, uh, you're recognized for an opening statement. Without objection, your written statement will be entered into the record. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Cartwright, members of this committee. I want to thank this subcommittee for inviting me to testify today on National Fentanyl Awareness Day. It is appropriate that on National Fentanyl Awareness Day that I'm given the opportunity to highlight for you the national tragedy that is being caused by fentanyl. According to the CDC, in 2022, 107,941 Americans lost their lives. 42% of Americans in the United States now know someone who has died. This tragedy has not spared cities, suburbs, rural communities, or tribal lands. Fentanyl is killing all Americans. Our communities today are being flooded with fentanyl, hidden in other drugs, or pressed into fake pills by two Mexican cartels, the Sinaloa cartel and the Jalisco cartel. We, during the past year, DEA has seized fentanyl throughout the United States at unprecedented levels. Just last year, we seized nearly 79 million fake pills laced with fentanyl and nearly 12,000 pounds of fentanyl powder. Together, this is more than 380 million potential deadly doses of fentanyl. For the nearly 10,000 employees working at DEA, there is no greater urgency than to defeat the Sinaloa and Jalisco cartels in order to save American lives. The 3.8 million increase that you have provided to DEA this fiscal year is invaluable support for our mission. Thank you. We know that you are under financial constraints and we are grateful. This increased funding will enable us to continue our critical work to defeat the cartels, to combat the fentanyl epidemic, and to save lives. Building on our many successes over the past year requires continued support and resources from Congress. With your support, we have continued to transform DEA to meet this unprecedented moment. Our counter threat teams, which we set up in 2022 and 2023, are active against every single part of the Sinaloa and Jalisco cartels and their criminal networks. These teams include special agents, intelligence analysts, targeters, program analysts, data scientists, and digital or cyber specialists. We also have partners from across the U.S. Gov government that have now joined our teams. The counter threat teams are providing DEA with an operating picture of each cartel that enables us to adapt to the ever evolving threat. We added a third counter threat team in 2023 to focus on the elaborate illicit finance of the cartels. This team is providing DEA with a detailed financial picture of the cartels, including their global money laundering operations. And I will, I'm sure we'll talk more about this today, but we are now tracking billions of dollars that are being moved by the cartels across the globe. The work of this team has allowed us to open a significant number of new money laundering investigations targeting these two cartels. In 2023, DEA took action against every single part of the global fentanyl supply chain run by the cartels. When I testified before you last April, we had just announced charges against 28 members, suppliers, chemical brokers, laboratory members, sorry, laboratory managers, weapons traffickers, assassins, and smugglers of the Chipitos network of the Sinaloa cartel that are responsible for bringing deadly fentanyl into the U.S. In May of last year, we announced Operation Last Mile, where we arrested 3,337 people across the United States 
for working in partnership with the two cartels to sell deadly fentanyl in our communities and on social media. Those investigations showed us that half of all cases were directly linked to the sale of fentanyl on social media. In June and October of last year, as part of our investigations into Chinese chemical company, DEA charged 12 Chinese chem chemical companies, 24 Chinese nationals, and took two Chinese nationals into custody. These are the first ever charges to be brought against Chinese companies for fentanyl trafficking, and they demonstrate that precursor chemicals are being sold, that they are cheap, that they are sold online on websites, they're shipped through common carriers, and payment for those chemicals are being made through cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Western Union, PayPal, Alibaba, and other common sources. In 2024, DEA continues to innovate and to work with urgency to save American lives. The insights we have learned from our counter threat teams, we're taking them and we're building the next step in the global fight against fentanyl by standing up the, tr the Trident Directorate. This directorate consists of two DEA-led joint operational task forces that will be staffed by individuals from across U.S. law enforcement, military, and intelligence communities so the United States can use every possible tool to defeat the Sinaloa and Jalisco cartels. Trident will allow us to leverage all of DEA's critical information on the cartels with our state, local, federal intelligence and defense partners. We believe that this joint task force will allow us to significantly disrupt the two cartels globally. We very much hope that Congress will continue to support this work and to help us defeat the cartels. Before I close, I imagine that you have read press reports regarding the DOJ proposal to reschedule marijuana. Because the formal rulemaking process is ongoing, and my role in that process is to determine the scheduling of drugs, it would be inappropriate for me to respond to questions on this rescheduling matter. I also want to take a moment and offer my deep thanks to every member of the subcommittee for, you work, for the work that you do on this National Fentanyl Awareness Day. The men and women of DEA are working tirelessly every day to defeat the cartels and save American lives and we all thank you for your support in fiscal year 2024. The threat continues and the work continues. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, we're now going to proceed under the five minute rule with questions for the witness. And I will begin by recognizing myself. <clears throat> Administrator Milgram, I understand that as of last month, DEA has approximately 13 visas pending Mexican approval. This has resulted in some DEA employees waiting six to eight months for visa approval to work in Mexico. Additionally, there are 13 DEA warrants pending extradition from the Mexican government. Do you believe your agents would say they are pleased with our law enforcement relationship with Mexico the same way the FBI director did? Uh, thank you so much, Congressman. And, and if I can, let me just start by talking about the global supply chain that the two cartels operate. They're based, those two cartels are based in Mexico. The cartels are sourcing chemicals from China, bringing those chemicals along with pill presses, dyes and molds to Mexico, mass producing fentanyl in Mexico, taking some of that fentanyl, pressing it into pills in Mexico, and then transporting it across into the United States. So the role that Mexico plays in this, and then they're involved in illicit finance and money laundering to get the dirty money back for their profits. So the role that Mexico plays across the global fentanyl supply chain is obviously a significant and critical one for all of us to be focused on. And as I've said before, before this committee, we're relentlessly focused on this. So let me say a few things about, about Mexico and the issue you raised. First, we are committed to working shoulder to shoulder with anyone across the globe who will work with DEA in partnership on this fight. The second is that I thought Director Ray said it very well when he said that the cooperation has been uneven and that we need much more. And I would echo, 
I, I would echo that. We have had some extraditions. We have seen the Mexican law enforcement destroy some labs, but there is so much more work to be done. Um, and we would, you know, we, we very much would like to partnership with Mexico in doing this. And finally, when you talk about the visas, um, just a moment to, to sort of really recognize the incredible work that's happening by the men and women in DEA in 69 countries across the globe, including Mexico. <laughs> That work is hard. They work relentlessly on this. And we are waiting on those 13 visas. I believe one has been pending for about eight months. Um, and unfortunately, everyone sitting in this room, we know, we know the price that we pay as a country when we wait that long. Well, let me ask you again. Do, uh, do you believe, are, are you pleased with our relationship with Mexico on this matter? Congressman, I would describe myself, and I would I would say this very clearly on National Fentanyl Awareness Day, that I think there is so much more work that needs to be done with urgency to stop this threat. So you're so not pleased. I, I'm I I I could not have higher regard for the men and women of DEA and the way that they're carrying out our mission. Um, and I believe that we need more assistance globally as we fight this threat. We also are doing more internally to meet this moment and and I couldn't say enough to you that you know my position is I'm never going to look a family member who's lost a loved one in the eyes and tell them I didn't do everything I could to stop this threat from happening. So I gather you're not pleased. There is much more work to be done. You're not pleased. Congressman, I would say that um, here's when I'll be pleased. I'll be pleased when there are no more American deaths from fentanyl. Amen. And and that's when I think we will all be able to say that that we've succeeded. I understand Mexico has created approval committees, uh, but these all appear to uh, amount to bureaucratic hurdles that did not uh, previously exist. What steps have the Department of Justice and the administration taken as a whole to improve uh, DEA's relationship with Mexico? Uh, have you observed any progress? Congressman, I'm, I'm not familiar with those committees. Um, in, uh, I, I do know that the Attorney General and the Deputy Atten Attorney General have gone frequently to Mexico um, and are often advocating on our behalf for visas, for extraditions, um, and for our ability to work jointly on operations together. With so much fentanyl flowing across our southern border from Mexico, and uh, all the new limitations Mexico has placed on DEA. How would you respond to Americans who view our counter fentanyl efforts as a war and the Mexican government complicit with the cartels? Uh, what I say often, Congressman, is um, right now we are in a, we're in a fight to save American lives. And this is as significant a fight as I think we've ever seen. Uh, you've heard me say this before, but we are losing the same number of Americans every 11 days that we lost on 9-11. So it would be impossible for me to overstate how important it is that we all be working together to stop this threat. And it is a grave threat, I believe, to the United States. I understand that since being confirmed and assuming the role of administrator of the EA in June of 21, You've been unable to meet with a single Mexican government counterpart. Is that true? I met with Attorney General Gertz, um, the head of the, uh, the Attorney General for Mexico. I met with him in 2021, I believe in the fall of 2021, at the Department of Justice. How can we sincerely believe the Mexican government is a partner in our counter drug efforts when, when they won't even meet with the head of our Drug Enforcement Administration. I understand the, the challenges that we face are grave. And again, Congressman, we, we stand ready to partner and work with any far, foreign counterpart that's willing to join us in this fight to save lives. Well, I want to tell you that for one member of Congress, I think you're doing a well of a good job under the most difficult of circumstances without any support from your superior functions in the government. Um, they're not giving you the weapons that you need, nor the support that you have to have. And uh, 
we will tackle that problem here in the subcommittee. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cartwright. Well, Administrator Milgram, I want to follow up on the chairman's line of questioning uh, about uh, partnering with the government of Mexico. We have to do it. Uh, I believe I understand you're not in the State Department, and uh, international relations is not your thing. But, uh, but we have to talk about this, and this is where the rubber hits the road uh, when we talk about the distribution of fentanyl into this country. It's coming from China. It's going to Mexico. It's coming here, and it's killing our kids. The chairman was asking you about delaying issuance of work visas to DEA agents, and that's what we're talking about. Mexico is delaying work visas to American DEA agents working in Mexico to get after the Jalisco and S Sinaloa cartels. Uh, I, I want to give you a chance to elaborate on exactly what effect that has on our operations. So uh, thank you for the question, and let me say a couple things, which is, as I, as I started um, to say to Congressman Rogers, to Chairman Rogers, we, we've been waiting eight months for one visa, and we know the cost of, of what that means for us in terms of our ability to get work done. Every year in the United States, we're losing more than 100,000 Americans. So time matters, and, and I couldn't speak with enough urgency as to how important it is for us to get those 13 agents and intel analysts into the country. The second thing I want to assure you and the committee is that our work does not stop. So we have more than 2,000 active investigations into those two cartels. We have many money laundering investigations, precursor chemical investigations uh, across the entire supply chain and, and into those two criminal networks. So I want to assure you that the men and women of DEA are working nonstop to defeat those cartels. Um, and we shouldn't ask them to work under difficult circumstances, but they do, and they're incredibly effective. I've seen firsthand for the last almost three years. And you did mention uh, the four indictments brought against uh, Chinese companies and individuals uh, for the manufacture and distribution of precursor fentanyl chemicals. Um, but you're not stopping there. You're continuing the investigation along those lines of, about Chinese companies producing precursor chemicals. Am I correct in that? So uh, you are correct, Congressman. The, the global supply chain that the cartels are running for fentanyl and these two criminal organizations dominate the entire global fentanyl supply chain. It starts and it ends in China. It starts with precursor chemicals, also pill presses that are being manufactured in China. Um, we are actively investigating the, the beginning, middle, and end of this supply chain. And just to talk for a minute about the end, we have seen a switch to Chinese money laundering. So essentially right now, the cartels are, are working with Chinese money laundering organizations essentially as their bank to clean money, to, to launder money um, throughout the globe, and that money is then going back to the cartels in Mexico. Well, we are the appropriations panel that funds your operation, and uh, do you need less money or more money to get, out, get after the, the Chinese bad guys? You know, I'll tell you, one of my first weeks, I spoke to one of our senior agents in the field, and he said, um, I'm tired of doing less. I'm tired, of, I'm tired of doing more with less. I'd like to do more with more. So I, I would quote him that, it, you know, my commitment to this committee is whatever you give us, we will use in this fight. Um, and already we're grateful for the support. Now, you, we talked about delays in Mexico. Let's talk about delays in the United States for hiring DEA agents. Uh, last year, you committed to working on reducing the time to hire special agents. Uh, in, in FY23, your average time to hire was roughly 452 days. And I understand as of February this year, your average time to hire in, in FY24 is down to 345 days, but I think it's still too long. When we're talking about an applicant pool that is eager to get to work, they don't have a year to wait around for an offer. What can you tell us about how you've changed your hiring practices since last year, and what is your target for average length of time to onboard special agents? So I I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this work. It's been ongoing at DEA. We've made a lot of progress to get to 245 days to hire. It's still too long in my estimation. I would like to see us between six and eight months to hire at the outside. Now, what we have done is we have mapped our entire hiring process, and we've created a dashboard so we can literally track every single applicant, where they are in the process, 
if there's a delay, we can figure out very quickly why there's a delay. And we have a weekly meeting where we are working to execute on our goals. And one of our goals is to significantly reduce this amount of time. I would say to you, Congressman, every time we put out a job application notice, when we invite people to apply, those notices close in a day or two. So I agree with you. We are seeing the desire out there for Americans to join DEA, and we need to make sure we're working quickly to get them on board. So we're ironing out the kinks and, and eliminating the bottlenecks. Is that yes. it? Yes, and we're, and we're making a lot of progress, but there's still more work to do. Well, good. Get after it. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Administrator Milgram, for being here. Uh, the honorable men and women of the Drug Enforcement Ag Administration play a vital role in interdicting Ill illicit, deadly drugs before they end up in the hands of unsuspecting Americans. But it's evident that you have, while you have our support here in this committee, uh, it's unfortunate that while the stakes couldn't be any higher, you have to deal with an administration that's actively undermining your efforts. Uh, I notice you have a 5% budget increase proposed, but uh, can you speak to the $10 million rescission by OMB from your budget request? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Yes, my understanding is that all agencies have been asked to take that rescission by OMB. So it's just across the board? Uh, that's my understanding. Okay. Well, um, we want to support you, and uh, but we also recognize that sometimes uh, the best of intentions by agencies like yours um, have unintended consequences. I want to discuss one of those. Uh, in 2020, DEA proposed a rulemaking to register emergency medical services agencies, EMS agencies, under the Protecting Patient Access to Emergency Medications Act of 2017. While the rule isn't set to go into effect until November of this year, I'm hearing concerns from rural EMS operations in my district. Uh, my understanding is that some EMS providers may have to scale down their certifications from advanced life-saving treatments to basic in order to achieve compliance with what limited resources they have. Um, are you concerned that this proposed rule may result in decreased availability in ALS treatments for those when they need it most? Uh, Congressman, I have, not, um, I have not looked specifically into that rule. I would welcome the opportunity to do that and to follow up with you. We would like to work with you on that. The proposed rule targets drugs scheduled two through five. Uh, however, it would end up pushing rural EMS to obtain a controlled substances registration, a CSR, in order to maintain a supply of basic schedule six drugs in one-for-one -one exchanges with hospital pharmacies. This includes drugs such as epinephrine, albuterol, and zofran. Um, volunteer EMS in rural communities in my district, like rural Bath County, are already bracing to try and afford these compliance costs to provide the most basic of life-saving services. Um, taking out loans is uh, being considered. Is DEA working on a solution, or can you commit to working on a solution to reduce the costs of compliance before my constituents experience the unintended consequences firsthand? Congressman, I'd, I'd be pleased to look at that. I'll, I'll start looking at it this afternoon, and we'll follow up with you. Okay, we'd like to find ways to reduce those compliance costs. I want to go back to Chinese per, uh, precursors. Um, last year, you said the only limit on how many fentanyl pills and how much fentanyl powder the cartels can make is how many chemicals they can buy. Uh, following their November 2023 summit, President Biden and Xi announced a verbal agreement in which the Department of Commerce would delist China's Ministry of Public Security from the entity list in exchange for counter-narcotics cooperation. Uh, however, a recent House China Select Committee report found that any form of cooperation was an empty gesture, considering the Chinese government is continuing to directly subsidize the manufacturing and export of fentanyl by awarding monetary grants to companies openly trafficking fentanyl materials. Um, in combating the fentanyl precursor trade, and uh, you have made it your top priority, and that is uh, our, ours as well. Do you think that this uh, rhetoric from the Biden administration rings hollow, considering that MPS has failed to make any arrests and has instead been found to have warned targets of U.S. investigations? So, Congressman, uh, thanks for the opportunity, because I, I think that this is one of the most important things we can be focused on and talking about. And as I noted earlier, the supply chain begins and ends right now in, in China. And so there's no way we could do the work we need to do without being focused on it. Um, I personally went to Beijing in January after the two presidents met. 
and I had the opportunity to have a number of meetings with MPS and with senior with senior leadership and law enforcement people uh, in China. And I'd say a few things, which is one, my commitment to you, this committee, um, is that we are going to continue to do the investigative work that we need to do around the cartels and the supply chains, wherever that takes us, including a deep focus on precursor chemicals and illicit finance. Two, we'll work shoulder to shoulder with any law enforcement agency that will work in partnership with us. This is a global threat. We know that those two cartels are now engaged in either drug trafficking or money laundering or you know, getting chemicals in more than 50 countries around the globe. So this is vital to the United States. Yeah. The last piece is we have had constructive meetings um, to date with MPS. What I would say to you is that it's too soon for us to know where this will end, my feeling is that because there is a limitless supply of chemicals, we need to do everything we can to stop that from happening. And so we'll do everything we can investigating. And also, if we can partner, we will. But we're not going to stop the work we have to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Ruppersberger. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, first thing, uh, I understand DEA is recommending a reclassification of marijuana as a less dangerous drug. Is that correct? Uh, Congressman, under the Controlled Substances Act, there's a formal rulemaking process for scheduling or rescheduling controlled substances. Um, that process is ongoing. The next step in that process will be a notice of proposed rulemaking and then an opportunity for public comment. Because DEA is involved very much in that scheduling process and the DEA administrator is personally involved in it, I, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on it at this time. My home state of Maine allows for adult use cannabis to be brought and sold under a licensed regulatory framework without fully descheduling cannabis from the Controlled Substance Act there will be inherent conflicts between federal and state law well, with whatever direction you recommend I urge you to strike a balance between ex exercising your federal oversight and enforcement responsibilities while preserving each state's ability to determine for itself the best approach to cannabis now, what's happening in Maryland working well and we want to preserve each state's ability to determine for itself the best approach to cannabis can you talk about the impact this recommendation will have uh, thank you congressman again I can't uh, get into details since this is an ongoing regulatory matter um, I appreciate your comments thank you okay, also uh, about fentanyl uh, at the beginning of the year DEA had a huge bust of pills uh, laced with fentanyl here in DC region uh, 639,000 pills, 2,000 pounds of drug in powder form, an almost 300 percent increase from the previous year. Please talk to us about the drug cartels or uh, how the drug cartels are working with local gangs and what tools and resources do you need to combat the cartels and gangs. Uh, also, please talk about the use of cryptocurrency as a tool to facilitate their activities and honestly, uh, what I'm interested in is technology like artificial intelligence and how it is used by the DEA in Operation Overdrive. Uh, thank you so much. So let me just start with uh, talking about seizures for a moment. Um, last year, I, as I noted, we seized almost 79 million fake pills, 12,000 pounds of, of powder fentanyl. That is the most fentanyl that DEA has ever seized. Every year since I've joined DEA, year upon year, we are seizing more <coughs> deadly fentanyl. Um, we're also seeing that the amount of purity in the, the fentanyl powder has gone up, and the number of pills that have a potentially deadly dose has gone up. So in 2021, when I started, it was four out of 10 pills. It's now seven out of 10 pills that have a potentially deadly dose. So I think the work that the men and women of DEA are doing, taking deadly fentanyl off the streets, is saving lives. Talking about gangs and local drug trafficking organizations, when we did Operation Last Mile last year, and that's the operation we did across the United States to identify people in local communities that are working with these two cartels, Sinaloa and Jalisco, to essentially you know, cross that last mile because the cartels need to get those pills into Americans' hands. That's how they make money. And the way that we've seen this done, we've seen it obviously it continues to be on the streets sometimes. But overwhelmingly, we've seen a shift to the digital world, to social media. Um, we say all the time that the most dangerous place in the world right now is our homes because everyone has a smartphone. And within two or three, you know, essential 
two or three uh, clicks on a smartphone, people are having pills delivered to their front doorstep like Uber Eats, like they get pizza delivered. Um, we're losing 22 Americans, teenagers, between the ages of 14 and 18 every single week right now. So this is a national tra tragedy, and I would suggest to you, first, we need help on technology. We are committed to using the best technology we can, and my personal feeling is we cannot allow the speed of crime to move faster than the speed of government. We have to be agile. We have to be able to meet these moments. The work I have seen from our cryptocurrency tracking our illicit finance team in the last year is second to none. It's some of the best work I've ever seen in my career. So we have a lot of data. We have a lot of technology. We need to do more and we need more, but we are making progress being able to track that money across the globe. So the answer is yes, we'd like to do more and we really appreciate the support of this committee. And I believe that we are setting ourselves up to be able to do this very effectively in the long term. Chelsea. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My apologies to my colleagues. I'm cutting in line. Appreciate it. Uh, Administrator Milgram, it's good to see you again. Hard to believe another year has passed of this uh, devastating uh, issue that we have in our country. You know, 47,000 men died in Vietnam, 33,000 in Korea. That was over the course of 23 years. And we equal that every year just in the loss of fentanyl. So if you want to take fentanyl plus fentanyl poisonings plus overdoses, in one year, it equals all the wars since World War II combined. That is a war. And that's a proxy war being put on us by China, being administered by the cartels in Mexico. Put another way, if you crashed an Airbus 321 from one airline every day in this country, do you think this body would act? Do you think the international community would act? So if you killed 200 people every day in one airplane, 365 days out of the year, we would be howling in this body, would be passing laws, we'd be grounding airplanes, and that's what they're doing. So this is China's way of ensuring that we don't have a military down the road, or workers, or welders, or plumbers, or police officers, or teachers. On December 6, 1941, we were at war with Japan, we just hadn't declared it yet. And right now we're at war with the cartels at least, and, that's, and you're at the front line of that job. So I want to thank you for what you and your team do every day and everybody who wears the badge. And I'd also like to say that just yesterday in my state, you worked very closely with um, local law enforcement in Georgetown, Texas, the, the local sheriff, the local police department, and you caught a guy who had two, two uh, kilos of meth, one kilo of her uh, heroin, and uh, 10 pounds of fentanyl. How many people would that kill? Uh, Congressman, I would I would have to do the math for you with our lab, um, but I can tens tell you thousands? T tens of thousands, tens of thousands. Yes. And so this, uh, I, I just want to point out, I really don't have a question, especially in lieu of the, the time that, that I've been granted. I just want to say you do a great job. And I know that each and every one of you has on your shoulders the idea that we're losing 70,000 Americans just to fentanyl every, every year. And you're the front line of defense. And that's got to weigh heavily on you. And uh, I appreciate the sacrifice that each and every one of you make, the stops that you're making, the work you do with local law enforcement. I went to visit your, your, your station in Dallas, right next to the FBI, that it takes a partnership with local and federal law enforcement, and your job never ends. And so uh, other folks have some questions for you. I'd like to yield back the balance of my time. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, Congressman. Mr. Morelli. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Administrator uh, Milgram, thank you uh, certainly for taking time to speak with us today, but also for your service to the country. Uh, and thanks to your entire agency, uh, the agents who work tirelessly uh, in my district around the country to keep our community safe. I wanted to, uh, if I could, talk a little bit about Operation Overdrive. Um, in 2022, the DEA initiated it, an operation uh, driven by data to focus uh, DEA law enforcement resource on communities, including my own in Rochester, New York, where criminal drug networks are causing uh, the most harm. Uh, and I want to thank you and your staff for continuing to be uh, in a position to comprehensively brief us on, on the phase of the operation and its successes. Um, can you just give me an update on phase two of Operation uh, Overdrive and what your team saw on the ground in the, uh, I think it's 57 operating 
uh, locations last year, including uh, the one in Rochester? Yes, th thank you, Congressman. So we launched Operation Overdrive in 2021. We started it, really effectively launched it in 2022. And the idea is really to go into local communities where we live and work and where every American is being impacted and focus on two things, violent crime and drug poisonings and, and deaths. And so we do that in partnership with our state and local law enforcement, with the local prosecutors, with the U.S. attorneys. We've now been in 86 locations across the United States, and we are very actively working on our next phase, which will be phase four. What we have seen um, from this work, I, I would note a few things, which is one, just remarkable partnerships with our local uh, with our local law enforcement, police departments, sheriffs. That's the kind of work that we need to be doing together to really effectively stop the next shooter in a community or stop the, next, the person who's gonna sell the next pill. Uh, one of the things I was reading recently was a report on Little Rock, Arkansas. We just finished work in Little Rock, Arkansas, and the team working together, and again, I want to give credit to the entire team, um, we geospatially mapped the community. And what that means is we're able to provide to local law enforcement a map of where the crimes are happening, where the shootings are happening, where the drug poisonings are happening, and that together lets us figure out how do we stop that harm. Um, and we saw significant reductions of both violence and drug poisonings. So we're about to announce, uh, we're gonna start moving on a rolling basis so we can keep moving in communities across the United States. And we're also moving to do that kind of geospatial mapping work across the country, wherever we're working, because that allows us to provide local law enforcement with more insight into what's ha what we see in the community, and they're able to provide us with insight into what they see, and then together we can identify what are the greatest threats, uh, who are the individuals that are causing the most harm, and then together we can pretty rapidly target those individuals to make sure that they cannot commit harm. Great, and are you confident that the Request the budget amount will allow you to do what you need to do in phase four. Yes, I'm confident that we can do that. And again, you know, what I would like to be able to do is really get to a point where the kind of geospatial work we're doing, we're able to leave behind in communities. I, I don't think we're financially there yet, but I would love to be able to help our local police departments. Um, I was a state attorney general and had the privilege of overseeing more than 500 police departments for the great state of New Jersey. And I know how much they could use that kind of help to be able to have that kind of assistance with the, the geographic mapping of threats and then getting access to what we see as the threats. So I'd like to evolve and get there, but right now I'm absolutely confident that we can do phase four and that, again, what makes this work is the partnership between the local and state law enforcement community, the prosecutors, and DEA, all of us together. And often we have other federal partners. We've had ATF, Marshals, FBI. So I'm really pleased with the work um, and the partnerships. Thank you. Uh, last year, uh, you were kind enough to uh, host uh, myself, Mr. Clyde, Mr. Elzey, uh, to uh, DA and Quantico. And uh, during that conversation, talked about illicit finances aiding the illegal drug trade, which I I actually thought was fascinating. And to that end, I understand your counter fentanyl threat targeting teams have been essential to uh, combating money laundering organizations and their expanded influence in the Mexican uh, transnational criminal organization. Can you just discuss a little more uh, DA's work um, to identify and mitigate the cartels, illicit finance networks uh, that are pushing fentanyl into communities like mine? Yes, so we founded the first two counter threat teams in 2022. And the idea is a very simple one of having people from across the, the agency, agents, analysts, targeters, data scientists, people with chemistry expertise, working together, focused directly on what are, what do the networks look like, mapping those networks, and then identifying vulnerabilities that we can target to take down and defeat the cartels. We were doing so much work very quickly around illicit finance that we realized last summer, in the summer of 23, that we needed to create a third team around illicit finance. So we have some of our finance experts from across the United States and across the globe that have now come together. They're some of the most creative people I have ever seen. They were able to really figure out how to leverage every piece of DEA's financial data in order for us to understand the threat and start tracking it globally. Um, we have a great number of money laundering, illicit finance cases, investigations ongoing, the majority of which right now relate to Chinese money laundering. And so you'll see in the coming months uh, a lot of that work coming forward. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you allowing me to go a little bit over, and I yield back. Mr. Ryderhold. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Rager. Thank you for being here and uh, for your uh, work. Uh, I uh, I know you had mentioned you you don't want to speak about the the uh, process of going to the schedule one to three in the marijuana, but I do want to ask you a little bit different question. I, I hope you can uh, answer that. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the um, there was a, a 2023 study by the National Institute of Health uh, and, and that referenced a, a rising influx of cases of reports of uh, cannabinoid uh, hyperemesis syndrome, and I'm probably saying that incorrectly, but I think it's, it's CHS is what's referred to, and states that typically individuals experiencing CHS uh, exhibit a distinctive pattern of cycling through nausea, vomiting, abnormal pain, uh, abdominal pain and often other um, several things over a several month period um, uh, prior to, uh, to cannabis use. And the CDC uh, said approximately three in 10 people who use marijuana have, have this order. Uh, can you speak to the, uh, uh, the adverse effects of marijuana use disorder? Uh, Congressman, because that is going to be a part of this regulatory process, it would be inappropriate for me to comment at this time. Um, but I appreciate your mentioning that study, and I, of course, I'll read it. Um, okay. Um, well, my understanding is that this same study that NIH referenced uh, did numerous studies uh, establishing a connection between marijuana use and elevated risk of psychotic conditions, including uh, psychosis, depression, anxiety schizophrenia and substance uh, use disorder. And let me just, and you know, I can speak to it, so let me just put my thoughts about it, uh, is I believe the United States is in the midst of a mental health crisis. And uh, with the adverse effects that I had just mentioned, uh, such as psychosis, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, a substance abuse disorder, my concern is rescheduling marijuana would make the crisis worse. And again, I know you say you can't comment on it, but I, I do want to go on record with that because I, I do think it's a real concern. And I'm very, very concerned about uh, this rescheduling. And um, it's uh, just very disconcerting to hear this. Um, and I'm deeply concerned about the impact that it will have, especially on the population of young Americans who are more susceptible to drug use uh, for the first time and as they're forming lifetimes of addiction. So uh, with that, let me say uh, there's many of us in Washington uh, and in the Congress, and I'm sure not all, but there's a lot of us who are very concerned about that. And uh, we, uh, we hope that this is something that is not done. And uh, I yield back. Ms. Bing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Administrator Milgram, I just wanted to uh, follow up on my colleague, Mr. Morelli's uh, questions and express appreciation as a representative of communities in New York City, Queens specifically, appreciation on the many ways that the DEA partners with our state and New York City local law enforcement agencies to take guns off our streets and to make our communities safer. Uh, I'm also proud of how the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which President Biden signed into law uh, in 2022, has empowered law enforcement and the courts to hold firearms traffickers responsible. As you know well, this act created the first federal criminal offense for firearms trafficking. I was glad to see that the DEA had worked with NYPD to dis dismantle a gun trafficking operation in Brooklyn. In March of this year, the defendants pleaded guilty to multiple charges related to the distribution of fentanyl and firearms trafficking. This case became one of the first cases in the country to use the provision of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act that made trafficking a criminal offense in federal law which makes a huge difference in a city like New York, where the overwhelming majority of crime guns were last sold from a licensed dealer from another state. Administrator, can you speak to how these provisions of this bill, this act, support the work that your agents are doing to take guns off our streets and reduce violent crime? And how is the DEA allocating resources 
to coordination efforts with local and state law enforcement to crack down on interstate, interjurisdiction firearms trafficking. Uh, thank you so much, Congresswoman. Um, you know, DEA, we are focused uh, relentlessly on drug trafficking and particularly on the fentanyl threat. That said, we have been doing extensive work around violence in our communities because we know the intersection between drugs and violence. It, they're, they're inextricably intertwined. And so we do work around Operation Overdrive, as you heard earlier. We also seize an enormous amount of illegal firearms as part of our law enforcement work across the United States. Last year, I think we seized more than 8,200 firearms as part of our operations. So we also partner very closely with all of the DOJ components Components, the FBI, ATF, Marshals, and um, in New York City, as you know, the ATF hosts a daily um, meeting with NYPD, with federal law enforcement. Um, prosecutors are in that room, state and federal, and they're talking about, you know, who are the individuals that are likely to be the next shooters, um, and really focused on, you know, how do they stop the threat of violence um, on the streets. And so DEA has a regular presence. We're at that meeting every single day. We have deep partnerships um, across the United States with our state and local um, law enforcement counterparts. And again, you know, our main focus is on drugs, but we are absolutely um, working on violent crime in communities and very strongly working in partnership. And one of the most important things I think is those partnerships because we call upon one another when we can you know be proactive in stopping the next crime from happening or when we need to you know uh, investigate and prosecute something that has already happened um, thank you I yield back mr. Garcia thank you mr. chairman uh, administrator Milgram good to see you again um, it, it dawned on me you have probably one of the most unenviable uh, positions uh, in the country right now. I, I, I don't envy you of your job. Um, it's like it's like being a goalie uh, where your own coach is actually calling plays to score against you right now, and it's got to be very frustrating. You don't have to comment on that, but we we do have a president right now that has an open border policy. Uh, you do work for an attorney general that has effectively relegated uh, the DEA to be, uh, in his words, uh, the very end of the line with the public affairs. Uh, mission or campaign. Uh, this has got to be very frustrating for you. And, and what that inference is, is that it, your, your job is to focus on the demand side and not the supply side, which is literally the opposite of what D the DEA is supposed to do. Um, your, your job description has the word enforcement in it. Uh, so we look forward as a subcommittee to giving you the tools to do your job, which is the enforcement side, to make sure that we can catch the bad guys, stop the cartels, and give you the resources despite the leadership above you. And by the way, uh, A.G. Garland gave himself an A in front of this committee just a couple of weeks ago, which was, in, in my opinion, offensive to the victims of uh, fentanyl. I was going to ask you if we're winning or losing this war against fentanyl, but I think that the metrics are self-evident. We're, we're losing this war right now, and I think it's okay for you to say that you're, you're not pleased. I think the chairman asked that several times because I don't think any of us are pleased with the number of deaths that we're seeing as a result of this uh, this poison coming across our borders. Uh, last year, you you uh, responded to Mr. Klein's uh, uh, testimony. He asked if you uh, would commit to calling China a major illic illicit drug trafficking or producing country. I'm, I'm assuming, and you answered in the negative in that uh, questioning, I'm assuming now that the PRC has been put on the major drug transit uh, and illicit drug uh, producing company lists that you would say the PRC is actually a, a, a country that we should be targeting as such? Uh, yes, Congressman. The, the majors list was changed to include precursor chemicals. Um, and so Congress, uh, along with the State Department, has listed China as a, a source of, of fentanyl production from those precursors. We, we appreciate your support on the communication of the chain of command for that. Um, uh, we talked about uh, the fact that some Chinese companies have been charged to, to this date. Uh, um, you have a $500 million budget footprint for foreign international companies going after those uh, folks. Uh, can you talk about um, if, that, if that budget is fulfilled, what does that mission look like, and, and how do we uh, continue on that? Uh, and I used the metaphor, I think, last year in this hearing that if – if we had a, a small or a large ship, a slow-moving ship crossing the Pacific f full of VX gas coming from China, we would stop that ship before it got to the port of Long Beach or, or Mexican port inbound for the U.S. Uh, borders. Um, talk to us about this, the, 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 the sort of TTPs and the, and the 
and the policies that this $500 million will enable for us. Um, thank you so much, Congressman. Uh, if I could start by just saying one thing about demand as well, because I sit in a lot of rooms uh, across the United States and across the world where people talk about demand, and w we very much understand substance use disorder. What we are seeing happening in the United States is not demand driven. And I want to be really clear that this is the cartels that are driving what we're seeing. That's why they're hiding fentanyl and other drugs. That's why they're pressing fentanyl into fake pills. That's why they're not selling fentanyl as though it were fentanyl. So I think it is a really important point. We do a lot of work around, we do do work around public awareness, one pill can kill, because the cartels are being so deceptive about how they're trying to get these drugs to Americans. Um, talking about you know, your analogy of stopping the ship, I think is a, is a great way to think about the analogy. What we have done over the past two years is try to map these criminal networks so we can get proactive and get, a front, get in front of them. Um, I believe that we will not be effective unless we are able to target these networks proactively. We cannot wait until the harm has happened or until there's a particular thing that happens to galvanize us. So what we do with the foreign work, foreign work is vital to DEA. We're in um, more than 69, we're in 69 countries right now, more than 90 offices around the world. All of those offices, their number one focus is the United States of America and the harm happening to the US. Of course, we assist our foreign partners with their local issues, but our prime work across the globe is how do we stop the fentanyl threat? How do we stop these two cartels? So having mapped, and I, I see the map in the committee, and I look at it, and I think about the map that the teams have done showing 50 countries yeah. that the cartels are active. So we're working in multiple countries across the globe and with many foreign partners. I just want to thank you because in LA we have a district attorney that won't charge uh, uh, fentanyl dealers with uh, uh, murder if they deal known uh, poisoned uh, uh, pills or, or corrupted pills. So. We are able to raise those uh, at the federal yes. level under the DEA, and we really appreciate uh, the ability to do that. Uh, and your comments that this is not demand-driven is not lost on us. This is policy-driven, uh, and education is key, but uh, we appreciate everything that you and the agents in the field are doing to, to, to mitigate this as much as possible. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Clyde. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Administrator Milgram, uh, good to see you again you today, too. and thank you for coming to my office yesterday. Thank you. If you recall in last year's budget hearing, you made a commitment to provide me and this committee certain information regarding use of no-bid contracts under your tenure, specifically the total of no-bid or sole source contracts administered during your tenure and the total value, dollar value of these contracts. My staff emailed your Congressional Affairs Office eight different times over the last year following up on this commitment. Uh, May 24th, June 8th, June 23rd, July 5th, July 14th, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And despite your staff promising that this request would be fulfilled soon, we never received a response. Now, <clears throat> your staff wasn't the one who made the commitment, Administrator. You made this commitment, and in this very room. Yes, sir. You know, and I realize the Department of Justice Inspector General is currently investigating your contract dealings, but Congress is also an investigatory body. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I was a young Navy officer, my first active duty station was Strike Fighter Squadron 161, and I had a commanding officer, um, Commander Al Gorthy, and he had three letters, uh, three words printed in our hangar bay, three foot high, so every solitary member of the squadron could see it. And those three words stuck with me my entire life, and those words were performance, not excuses is all I have gotten for the last year has been excuses. I believe you're one of the few agencies within the Department of Justice to actually get a budget increase last year. But yet I still do not have the information I have requested. And so you can add to that list not just the number and dollar value of no bid contracts, but also list them individually by recipient so we can see who got them and with what dollar value was associated with each one. I mean, I guess I can add them up. You don't have to give me the total. But my question to you then is, <clears throat> when will you provide me with this information? So Congressman- By what date? Uh, let me start by apologizing for the delay on this. As I, as I said to you yesterday, it is not acceptable, and you have my commitment that it will not happen again. Um, we do a weekly meeting where we track a number of things at DEA. We've been tracking letters back to members of Congress. We have not been tracking QFERS until recently. We are now tracking that. So you have my solemn commitment on that. Um, 
I have worked with, and again, I want to take responsibility for this, the answers went to the Department of Justice just last week. And so we are working very actively with them to get them to you. I had hoped to get them to you by the end of the day yesterday. That did not happen. So I think it's imminent. Um, I'd be happy to actually call your office. We can call your office every day and give you a status update. It's not in our hands right now, um, but I think it will be very, very soon. And I would appreciate that. Thank you. I will uh, accept your offer. Thank Please you. to let us know on a daily basis. Yes, Actually, sir. Actually, no, no, a weekly basis would be just fine. You got it. Let us know when we have that information, when you have that information, because we would like to follow up on it. Um, <clears throat> in the t FY23 budget, there was a $30 million program increase for the information sharing center that your administration requested. Uh, was that for what's called mission, the mission operating system or mission OS, or was that for another purpose? I'm not sure, Congressman. Um, I'd have to look closer at it. I do know that there was some funding that came for our internal um, data overhaul, our technology overhaul. Um, mission OS would be a part of that. We continue to work on developing that. But I'm, I'm not sure about that specifically. Okay. Can you, can you briefly describe to me then um, what... Uh, what you're doing with the mission operating system or mission OS. Yes, so uh, to come very high level and then a little more granular, when I came in I found that we had a lot of technology that was over 20 years old. And as you know, and, and you'll see this when you look at our sole source contracts, which mm -hmm. we've reduced by more than a third, but you'll see that a lot of those relate to technology. Our systems are so old that to have coders, n nobody codes in the same languages that our systems were built in a long time ago. All of that needs to be upgraded. At the same time, we need to make changes so that, uh, another example, when I came in is we were only tracking one drug at a time. Obviously, right now, we live in a poly drug world, so we cannot be effective unless our system lets us capture multiple drugs. So we've already made a lot of those changes, but Mission OS is basically the broader system we're creating that will allow, one, us to collect all the information we need to collect digitally, um, and then, two, our systems to be able to talk to each other. So think about the hiring conversation earlier of how we track across systems, how we basically are able to make sure that, and what our counter threat teams are able to do is, any agent working in Des Moines, Iowa can connect with the information from any agent in Maine. So we're already able to do that, but that system is still developing. And, and again, my feeling is, yep. So what's its current status? Uh, it, we made a number of changes, um, but, the, but the sort of overall, I, I would use Mission OS to describe our overall, like the, the sort of place we want to get to, which is we're not there yet, but we have made a number of system changes, um, and we are already, I think, taking a lot of ground on it. Okay, I think my time has expired, so I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Administrator. We always talk about the problem. We always put blame on somebody else, but yet our country continues to fall further and further behind, and I'm very frustrated with that. I want to talk about solutions. Uh, I think back to my time in the military. You train the way you fight. You fight the way you train. Your allies are your allies, and your enemies are your enemies. Let's line them up. Let's 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 go to war, and 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 you know may the may the strongest person win. Um, when I look at allies, we need more allies, and I think the allies are your are the allies on the ground that are doing the work. The sheriffs, the police chiefs, the uh, the the constables, the local law enforcement. So my question, I fully support. My question is this. I fully support state and local task forces. I continue to hear every day how critical they are for the ongoing criminal and counter drug smuggling efforts. This is absolutely critical that we have a federal, state, and local nexus that tackles and wins and makes sure our communities are more safe. You reported in your budget that through the fourth quarter of fiscal year 23 that there are approximately 2,800 special agents and 3,000 task force officers across 600 task forces dedicated to transnational crime and, and, uh, and drugs. Is there, any, is there a need for additional special agents or task force officers? Uh, so a, a couple of things, uh, Congressman. First is, as we stand up these Trident teams, uh, one is being stood up along the border. We're going to use our El Paso office um, because we have we have great capacity there. And one, one is going to be set up in New York to start. These will be state, local, federal teams that also have the intelligence community and the defense community. So that's an example, I think, of evolving to the next step where we'll be able to use every piece of information that DEA has to target this international threat. 
Um, we serve in task forces across the United States every day. We have remarkable partnerships. Um, we lead many OCDEF task forces. We also serve on many task forces, OCDEF, HIDA, and otherwise. And so this is one of the ways in which I think we do really important work across the country. One of my personal views is that we need to figure out how we can share more information with our state and local partners. Um, again, I sat as a state attorney general, and I know you know, we're talking about tens of thousands of law enforcement professionals across the United States that are on the front line every single day and are incredible partners to us and can be very effective um, and work with us on a daily basis with this threat. But how do we provide even more support and information on the cartels and on the threats to them to help them? Uh, the, do DEA, the DA needs a win and uh, America needs a win. And I'm tired of so, uh, everyone else placing the blame on on the problem we need a win and that win starts at the local level with these task forces we need to go out and take it block by block street by street i had the fbi uh, on friday i'm going to be in west texas and we're doing a round table with local state and, and federal law enforcement to specifically talk about expanding some of these task forces that are out there this is how you win you don't talk about the problem, you solve the problem. You solve the problem by getting more good guys than bad guys and rolling them up one block at a time. Blank checks aren't gonna solve the problem. Blaming China or someone else, that's all fun and dandy. That doesn't keep our kids safe and it doesn't make sure people don't die. That's what this game is about. This is about life or death. It's a life or death uh, game that we're playing and the DEA used to be at the center of this game. They used to be a major chess piece in this game. And it feels as if now they're a smaller uh, uh, part of it. And that needs to change, right? That needs to, you have my commitment, but I need your commitment where we can, we can uh, work together on building out these task forces in a more robust manner. And also, when we do roll up somebody, that the world knows about it. It can't just be in, in secret. Uh, Congressman, first of all, uh, you know, again, on National Fentanyl Awareness Day, um, you know, you have my deepest commitment that I will never stop doing everything I can to stop this threat. Um, I do believe we have a plan and we're making significant progress, but we have lost 107,941 American lives in 2022. So there is a lot more work to do. We're committed to doing it in partnership with you uh, in Texas and with, with this committee and with every American community. Um, I, have, I have a limited time left. I'll end with this. I'm very interested in the Trident directed, uh, Directorate and the direction of that's going. Intel is absolutely critical to solving the problem and being able to give that in an actionable way with boots on the ground to be able to do that, I think is so critical. And many times they, they wanna be able to do it, but they don't have the intelligence to be able to perform that. I'm very interested in that. Would love to, to stay abreast of that. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Administrator, and I yield back. Thank you. Gentlemen, yields back. Uh, that concludes the first round of uh, questions. I assume that uh, there is a desire for a second round yes. by some members at least. So we will do just that. And that's consistent with your desire to be out of here by noon. And we will uh, live up to that commitment. Uh, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Uh, Ma'am, you've previously testified before this subcommittee on the flow of fentanyl precursor chemicals from China to Mexico. In November of 23, uh, President Biden announced a partnership with China where they would help stem the flow of precursor chemicals. I understand that China's new efforts are mainly civil enforcement matters with little to no actual criminal enforcement. Uh, has the DEA observed any significant decrease in the amount of precursor chemicals flowing from China to Latin America? So Congressman, at, at, at this moment in time, and, and we work very closely with our partners at CBP on the flow of precursor chemicals, um, at this point in time, we, we continue to see precursor chemicals going to Mexico for the production of fentanyl. Um, and again, we continue to see fentanyl being produced at, at historic and catastrophic rates. Um, what I would say to you is that 
we, DEA began our re-engagement with MPS in January of this year. Um, we had partnered with MPS, and again, in 2019, China had scheduled Finnish fentanyl. Um, so we began that re-engagement of January of this year and have had some constructive meetings. Uh, we are committed to working with any partner across the globe that we can work with to fight this threat. We also are continuing to do all the investigative work that DEA d does and has done over the last couple of years. And again, bringing the first uh, criminal charges against Chinese chemical companies and really focusing on the movement of those chemicals. So we're gonna continue to do that work investigating. We would like to see um, our partners in China take similar actions. Um, and again, we're a law enforcement agency and we always ask our law enforcement counterparts to engage in law enforcement activity. So not only did we not see a decrease in precursors out of China, but we're seeing an increase. Is that accurate? Uh, Congressman, I, I couldn't say that. I would, I would have to bring in my colleagues from CBP to, to sort of point to the exact numbers. What I can tell you is that fentanyl has increased over the last three years in the United States. And this partnership, this work um, has been constructive so far, but I believe it's too early to know uh, whether we'll have the results that we want to see. And again, you know, my commitment to you is that we are doing this work and we will continue to do this work. Um, and as long as there's a global fentanyl threat, we're going to continue to investigate every part of that supply chain. Based on recent actions, how would you characterize our relationship with China? when it comes to the fight against fentanyl? Uh, and, and what would you say to those who, view, who, who like to view China as complicit with the cartels? So Congressman, when I came in, we had no uh, law enforcement cooperation or even communication, really, with, with MPS, which is the Chinese law enforcement agency. That, that changed starting last November when the two presidents, President Biden and President Xi met. Um, and they agreed to resume counter-narcotics cooperation. Uh, so there are a few things that, that, we've, that we've done. One is ask for their help in prosecuting and shutting down chemical companies, stopping pill presses from going out of China. Um, number two, being willing to stop global money laundering and cryptocurrency that is originating, we believe, in many instances from there, um, going into the capital flight issue, which we could talk a little bit about if you'd like. Um, and then number three, scheduling additional chemicals. So one of the things China did effectively in 2019 was to schedule finished fentanyl. Um, so there are many fentanyl chemicals, the precursor chemicals that are the building blocks that we've now asked them to schedule. Um, just to be clear also, what we know from our investigations is that there are people working at those chemical companies <laughs> that are chemists who are actively assisting drug traffickers or people they believe to be drug traffickers with how to produce fentanyl. So they are essentially teaching them how to make fentanyl. So I want to be clear in saying what a grave threat I believe this is and also that I believe if we could stop the flow of precursors from China, we could have a significant impact on the amount of fentanyl being made. How are we supposed to reconcile the administration's November 23 <coughs> announcement that China is a partner on the efforts to combat fentanyl with what our DEA agents are actually seeing out in the field? So, Congressman, I think, you know, what I would say to you is that the, the meetings have been constructive, but it's too early to tell what the results will be. So I'd be happy to come back to the committee as this goes on to let you know whether, whether we're seeing the results that, that we believe we need to see. How would you rate Mexico's lack of action to get your people into Mexico in, in place? How would you characterize China's impact on that matter? So, uh, you know, I, w I would sort of take the same position as to both countries, which is, number one, we stand ready and willing to work with any law enforcement partners that will work with us in this fight um, that are committed to helping us stop American lives from being lost. Second, we're going to keep doing the investigative work that we do. And DEA has incredible capabilities. I'm so proud of the men and women in the United States and across the globe that are working on this threat day in and day out, even in difficult circumstances. 
and and third, I do think we've seen some progress, but you know, again, to to sort of refer back to Director Ray, we need much more, and we've got to see sustained, uh, scalable cooperation in order for us to be able to have the impact we know we need to have. And again, the the threat is driven by two global criminal enterprises that are headquartered in Mexico. Keep up the good work. Thank you, sir. Mr. Carly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Administrator Milgram, not to put too fine a point on it, I, I am in, interested in more questions about uh, precursor chemicals. Uh, your written testimony includes the following statement. On June 23, 2023, in, indictments were announced against four chemical companies and eight individuals all based in the PRC, the People's Republic of China, for knowingly providing customers in the United States and Mexico with the precursor chemicals and scientific know-how to manufacture illicit fentanyl. These indictments were the first ever charges against fentanyl precursor chemical companies. Is that correct? That was the first time? Yes, sir. How long has fentanyl been hurting Americans? Uh, the threat really began in around 2014. Um, 2014 or so, and, and slowly increased year so, upon year. So there have been a few presidential administrations during the fentanyl crisis, but this administration is the first one to prosecute Chinese companies. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. The first charges were last year. And do you intend to keep that up? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Um, I want to shift gears and talk about marijuana for a moment. Uh, last week, the administration announced that they would be looking to reclassify marijuana from a Schedule I narcotic, for example, heroin or LSD, to a Schedule III narcotic, for example, steroids or Tylenol with codeine. That will still need to go through a formal rulemaking process, and you alluded to that in response to Mr. Adderholt's questions. Uh, uh, you are restricted uh, substantial in how much you can go into that by, I think it's the Am Administrative Procedures Act? Yes, sir. Um, so I won't ask you to uh, get into DEA's formal position on the decision to move forward with that rulemaking, but I do want to ask you to give us a sense for how that reclassification of marijuana might allow DEA to allocate more resources to chasing fentanyl and other narcotics that are killing people. In other words, do we have agents that are working on marijuana investigations that could be freed up to go to work on cases tied to fentanyl? Uh, Congressman, because some of this will implicate decisions that become a part of that rulemaking process, I'm, I'm not going to be able to comment on that. Um, what, what I can tell you very, very high level is, yes, we do, uh, we do currently do work around uh, marijuana across the United States where um, it rises to the federal level. And, you know, for an example, we've done work in a number of states on current illicit uh, marijuana grows that are led by Chinese organizations, for example. So there, there is work we do. Our top focus is obviously fentanyl, um, the drug that's killing the Americans, but we, we do do work on it currently. Okay. And now you have said, uh, in fact, uh, you let off your testimony by, by, uh, by saying flat out, there is no greater urgency than defeating the Jalisco and Sinaloa cartels on fentanyl. Uh, but beyond that, can you walk through what your top priorities are in the FY 2025 budget request? Yes, sir. Um, so the, the two main pieces that we've requested in this budget are uh, additional funding, more than $18 million, for the counter threat teams. This is allowing us to map the cartels and these criminal networks across the globe. Who are members, who are facilitators, who are associates, what countries are they operating in, and what are they doing? What are their roles in the organization? That allows us to look for vulnerabilities and, and to really, I think, target um, in a way that can defeat the cartels. We're then going to sort of expand this into the trident work I was describing. So a lot of the work is coming out of the counter threat teams right now. And, and I should, sorry, step back and say we've started counter threat teams in the field. So each of our field divisions now has one. There, some are just getting up and running. But the idea with the funding would be to allow us to sort of establish the teams that we have at headquarters now, those three teams, in a permanent way, add staff to them, and then create 
broader teams in the field that will allow us in every single part of the United States to be able to know what's the specific threat there. Is it Sinaloa? Is it CJNG, Jalisco? Um, what are they doing? Who are the money launderers responsible? And so on. And so it really is the evolution of that work as well as the expansion into Trident. The other uh, request, which I think is a little more than $15 million, is for body-worn cameras. The Department of Justice, DEA, we've made a commitment to uh, expand the use of body-worn cameras. And so as a matter of public accountability and transparency, that work continues. Understood. Well, thank you for your testimony. Uh, Administrator Milgram, uh, you've been a state prosecutor. You've been a federal prosecutor. You've been a federal law clerk. You've been a state attorney general. Uh, we are grateful for your service in the DEA and this administration. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you again, Administrator, uh, for, for obliging us a second round. Uh, I ended the last uh, line of questioning with the, the partnership between uh, the local law enforcement and the DEA at the federal level, specifically the federal uh, charges being raised against uh, dealers who are selling this stuff. We have uh, text messages uh, coming off of phones of dead children, 16-year-olds, uh, where the dealer admits that the batch that they gave them may be tainted uh, and not made correctly because uh, little Johnny died yesterday. So little Susie, when you take this, make sure someone is with you with Narcam to make sure that uh, they can bring you back to life. Um, th this is self-evident uh, uh, in, in terms of an aggravating assault, a, a murder, uh, effectively. Um, and I, we talked about in my county, uh, North L.A. has the highest den density of fentanyl poisonings in, in all of LA, L.A. County. We had 80 just in my district alone last year in, in the 27th Congressional District. Um, we have a DA, who's, uh, who, DA George Gascone, who's like the penguin of Gotham City. He actually helps the criminals rather than uh, helps the victims of the criminals, and it's, it's very frustrating. So having this ability to go to the federal government to prosecute with the aggravators is, is key. I, I submitted a, a Combating Fentanyl Poisoning Act uh, bill, which allows for two Burns grant, uh, Burns JAG grants, uh, one um, to directly fund local law enforcement uh, for the efforts of chasing down these dealers uh, in cooperation with the DEA. Uh, and another for nonprofits to educate uh, kids, parents, grandparents. By the way, I think that's not your job. Your job is the enforcement side. Our job as parents and, and grandparents and neighbors and teachers and friends is to educate kids on the fact that this, this is a very real threat. One pill, one, one kill is very real. Um, so I guess my question is, w what can we do to better synergize uh, so that the federal government and the local law enforcement, regardless of county DAs, regardless of state AGs paradigms that, that may be pro-crime, um, how do we better synergize so that one plus one equals three? Uh, because that, that is the challenge. The policies are the problem. The open border policy is, is the source of the problem. China is the source of the precursors. But how do we get to one plus one equal three on the enforcement side? So this, this is a really important area of our work right now. We call it OD justice. And a lot of the work we're doing across the US is based on our original. What does that stand for, OD, it, OD uh, justice? O, OD justice, it's, it, it's basically one of our operations that we now have in every single field division. A lot of that work is based on the work that the teams in LA have stood up. Yeah. I mean, there's remarkable work that's been happening there, I think for many years between local law enforcement and the DEA. And we've used that and, and work in a couple of our other field divisions as a model for how we can do this partnership with state and local law enforcement. We now have this in every single field division across the United States, and I'm pleased that you know we've significantly increased the number of cases that we can do where we charge death resulting, meaning that someone is given a, a pill or powder that contains fentanyl, they die, and we're able to bring federal prosecutions, um, holding them accountable. So we've also set up a special unit at our special operations division in Virginia for local law enforcement. We have checklists for what they should look for when they get to 
um, the scene where somebody has been poisoned or overdosed. They've, we've got a checklist. What do they do? Who do they call? And we have agents in the field who are on call at all times to answer those those questions. And then when we can, we adopt those as to federal cases. Yeah. So it's really important work, and I think we've really significantly increased it, and, and L.A. has been a model for the work that we've done. Yeah, we appreciate that because seeing these parents grieve and, frankly, seeing the sheriff's uh, frustrations at the local level, they have clear cases where – they have all these text messages, and then the DA doesn't file charges. Um, it's it's absurd. So uh, that partnership is literally the only lifeline of hope uh, being given to some of these victims' families right now and to the sheriffs who are out there trying to do God's work, enforce the law. They have a venue and a vehicle now to bring federal charges, and I, I, I applaud you, and I thank you for allowing that and encouraging that. I'm glad that's spreading across uh, other major cities and throughout the country as well. Uh, I think the technology piece is also very important. You have access to technologies that maybe some of the local law enforcement agencies don't, um, whether it's uh, surveillance or drones, uh, uh, et cetera, where, where we stay within the limits of the Constitution, but we, we also uh, improve the uh, prob probabilities of uh, successful arrests and preventing this uh, poison from getting on the streets. So thank you again for your service and regards to all of the agents in the field. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ruppersberger. Well, first thing, I want to thank you for all of your experience. You bring a lot of experience to this job. I was uh, years, and I mean many years ago, a former investigative prosecutor, and most of what you do, it was we worked federal, state, and local together, and it was really effective, um, probably more effective than any, any other law enforcement that I've seen. Um, I, I think that um, the, the biggest problem that we have now I think is money, no question. But I think that DEA, and I'm giving based on my experience as a prosecutor, but more so just in this committee, that the DEA uh, uh, people who work at DEA, especially the agents, are very unique. Um, they they work in tough places where it's very dangerous, where FBI and other areas probably don't have the backup, and yet they're they're on a continual basis uh, working in that regard. So I just want to say that that. And you, you seem to be involved and want to help them in any way you can, and we appreciate that. Now, um, can you talk more about the Chinese money laundering um, and about fentanyl, and what can the Appropriations Committee do to help you? I know there's not a lot. What staff resources do you need to investigate uh, uh, tracking and stopping all of this that's going on? And do you know what Treasury is doing about all of this also? So we work very closely with Treasury, and again, they, they often will bring sanctions when we've done an investigation. So we have a very close partnership with them. They have folks that are stationed with us at our headquarters, um, and we've invited them to join the counter threat team. We think they could be very, very helpful on the finance work um, along with us. In terms of what we're seeing on illicit finance, um, to explain it just a little bit, uh, in 2016, China passed a law limiting the amount of money that can that Chinese nationals can take out of the country. And so that has created uh, a space where individuals in China who would like to get money out of China be above that amount. It's about 50,000 US dollars, the equivalent. So somebody who wants to get that money in the US needs to use a money broker. And those money brokers are now essentially becoming the engine of global, um, at least in the United States, fentanyl money laundering. Because the people in the United States that have cash, that have cash that's available for individuals who want cash in the United States are the cartels. They uh, obviously, drug trafficking, we believe that the cartels are making each fake pill for around 10 cents a pill, and they're selling it in the US for between five and $30. So again, we're tracking billions of dollars globally. A lot of the, the reason I think it has shifted to Chinese money laundering organizations is this desire to get money out of China. Um, we are seeing across the United States that these Chinese money laundering organizations are almost essentially the bank for the cartels where they can put their dirty money, launder it, and then that money eventually gets back to the cartels. Okay, go back. By the way, do you know someone by the name of Peyton Abbott? Yes, she's amazing. Yeah, she, uh, she was trained by me. Yes, thank you. Thank you. She's she's an incredible part of our team. Yes. Mr. Clyde. Thank you for letting her come to us. Thank you, Chairman. Um, 
Administrator Milgram. Okay, according to a letter dated December 19th, 2023 from the DEA's Office of Congressional Affairs, the DEA has the final authority to schedule, reschedule, or deschedule a drug under the Controlled Substances Act. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so you're the final. You're, you're it. Uh, yes, there is a regulation. Yes. All right. In your statement, you mentioned that it has been publicly reported and confirmed by the DOJ that a notice of proposed rulemaking to reschedule marijuana from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3, um, and it is currently being considered by the Office of Management and Budget. Um, Mr. Chair, I ask unanimous consent to um, enter into the record this particular article. It's a U.S. DEA will reclassify marijuana ease restrictions according to the AP News from April 30th, 2024, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> in this particular article, it says the proposal, which still must be reviewed by the White House Office of Management and Budget, and it says also today the Attorney General circulated the proposal to reclassify marijuana from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3. So, Administrator Milgram, is the decision to reschedule marijuana being initiated or encouraged predominantly by the Wh White House Office of Management and Budget, the Attorney General's Office, or the DEA? Which uh, is it? Congressman, there will be a notice of proposed rulemaking that's released. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to get into this conversation right now. Okay, so you have said multiple times that it would be inappropriate for you to talk about this, okay? Uh, inappropriate or illegal? A violation of law or just inappropriate? Uh, in inappropriate according to our counsel that I should not be engaged in a conversation about it. And, and just to sort of explain a little bit of that, okay. um, since DEA is ultimately the decider of scheduling and rescheduling uh, and the DEA administrator is in that role, it would be inappropriate for me to make comments about this process or parts of that process. Well, we're the United States Congress. Uh, you wouldn't have authority if we didn't give it to you, okay? I mean, we make the law, you execute the law, we give you the authority, we're asking the questions. So, I mean, it's like you're an extension of us when we create the law, so I'm asking you the question. Where is it coming from? Is it coming from the DEA? Is it coming from the Attorney General? Is it coming from the White House Office of OMB? Where is it coming from? It, as you know, under the Administrative Procedures Act, which Congress has made into law, okay. there is a formal rulemaking process that goes on. That leads to the uh, issuance of an NPRM, mm -hmm. then the opportunity for public comment, uh, and then the process plays out beyond that with an ultimate decision being made uh, at DEA on, as to the scheduling or rescheduling of a substance. So again, as, as the agency that will be the ultimate decider, um, I'm not gonna engage in, in conversations about, about issues that could be part of this conversation. I mean, marijuana is a very, very dangerous drug. Okay, not as dangerous as some of the others we've talked about here, but it, it certainly is much more dangerous than what you see regularly that people partake of, like um, alcohol, et cetera. Um, you have a, a significant increase in traffic accidents that we have seen that have sent people to the um, emergency rooms like uh, simply because they have been partaking of marijuana. So. Um, Have you had any outreach from the White House or the Vice President's office regarding the rescheduling of marijuana? Uh, Congressman, again, I'm not gonna be able to get into any, any of the process um, th that takes place or has taken place on this. Okay. Are you aware of any instance in which a, a rulemaking that schedules, reschedules, or deschedules a drug under the Controlled Substances Act is not signed by the administrator of the DEA? Um, just, st again, stepping out of marijuana and talking about this generally, uh, I am not. Okay. All right. So. I, I'll, I'll look and confirm general. that's accurate, but at least in my experience, uh, I'll, I'll confirm that with your office, but I, I'm not aware personally. Okay. All right. All right. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. Mr. Morelli. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again, Administrator. I, I wanted to... Um, uh, first of all, I was going to ask about the Trident Directorate. Mr. Cartwright asked the question, so I appreciate your response to that. Um, but uh, I, one of the things that I'm interested in, you could perhaps help expand on this, is, you know, I've always assumed that the cartel's interest was in creating sort of dependency, addiction, 
and you have a market that you continue to um, supply because there's a demand. I understand that that's changed. Part of what has resulted in your uh, one pill can kill uh, project to educate the American public. So it's really no longer in the interests of the cartels per se to make sure that people stay alive so they can continue to feed that addiction. The models changed pretty dramatically. I wondered if you could just, just help the American public understand what we're dealing with right now and sort of the new mode of operation. If you could just walk through that and then why the one uh, pill can kill campaign is so important to that. So uh, you just asked the question that I think we get asked more than any other, um, including when we go to schools, where, wherever we are, people always ask the same question. Why would a drug dealer kill their customer? And it, it's sort of the right way to think about it in the older model of drug trafficking. When I was coming up in the Manhattan DA's office, we, we strongly believed that drug traffickers did not kill their clients. And in part, it was based on some relationship. Even relationship is a strange thing to say, but you, drug traffickers knew their clients. Clients knew who to go to to purchase drugs from. We now live in a, a largely digital world where more than 200 million Americans are on social media. And the cartels can operate largely anonymously without ever knowing their client, and the clients don't know their traffickers. And so this has completely changed what we see. We're also in a world where, again, the cartels are actively trying to deceive people. They are not selling fentanyl as fentanyl. They're selling it as fake pills that look identical to real oxycodone, to real Xanax, to real Adderall, or they're hiding it in other drugs that they sell as though it were cocaine when it's actually cocaine laced with fentanyl. And so this whole model has changed. And we think about this a lot as Cartels want to sell more drugs. Fentanyl is the most addictive substance we've ever seen, 50, 50 times more powerful than heroin. So they're using it to get people to come back again and again. And as long as people survive, they believe that they will have more customers. And if they die to the cartels, that's the cost of doing business. And they're going to go back on social media and they're going to find someone else. And so, so it's interesting that in a sense... The, the, it, it, you can become addicted clearly. It, one pill can kill, but it may not. So you're, you're building essentially a market of repeat customers. But, you know, to the degree they might die, it's just, you know, as to you said, the cost of doing business because of the addictive nature of this and because of the deception in their practices. So it's not only that you need to get hooked on this. They don't even care about that. It's if you needed legitimately an opioid for a medical condition or you're buying it what you think you think you're buying it through a prescription and you're not that's really part of the the additional danger now to Americans so any American and, and and I always like to emphasize this anyone who gets a prescription from your doctor and fills it at their pharmacy you have nothing to worry about Th those painkillers or other drugs are absolutely fine because they're highly regulated they're highly regulated what the cartels have done is buy pill presses from China along with dyes and molds so they can make a pill that looks identical to an Oxy, identical to a Xanax, identical to an Adderall. They then advertise them for sale oftentimes on social media as though they are real Oxy. So I'm a patient who may be dealing with some knee issue, some, some issue that requires this prescription I get the prescription from the doc, but instead of going to my local pharmacy, I go online and think oh, I can get it cheaper this way. Is that essentially how it works then? What we see a lot is that people are looking for, uh, whether it's an Oxy, an Adderall, a Xanax, some of those people have had prior prescriptions, some have not. Some are young people who are looking for a painkiller, for anxiety or, or some other issue. We should be really clear in saying you cannot buy a legitimate prescription drug on social media yeah. at all. That is not for sale. And so anything that any young person finds on social media, they sh is, is we can tell you, with is going to be most likely fentanyl. Um, and again, that's killing people. And so we want to be really careful. We're also seeing this. Uh, this goes across the United States, all ages. Yeah. Please. So, so I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm just running out of time. I just wanted to ask one quick follow-up. Have you been in consultation with the major platforms about advertising those on, on social media? 
So we, we are pushing social media very hard to do more. Um, I don't think we would get to 107,941 deaths if not for the scale and scope of social media. And again, you know, we are asking them to, to take a zero tolerance policy, to raise public awareness. There are, there are a host of things we are pushing them to do. Again, thank you for your service. Thank Mr. You. Chairman, thank you so much. I yield back. The DEA's budget request uh, outlines a substantial Increase substantial increase for counter threat teams to combat fentanyl. While you're having so much trouble operating abroad and don't appear to be receiving the necessary support from the administration, how can we be assured that uh, we're making a smart investment in the agency at this time? So, Congressman, let me say that uh, we did talk about it being difficult to work in some parts of the world, but let me assure you we have incredible foreign partners. Um, I've met with dozens of foreign partners over the last year, and we have incredible cooperation as the United States of America. I was at the Five Eyes law enforcement meeting just last week here in Washington, and we, I, our, our relationships and our partnerships are very strong, and the work we're doing together is very effective. So uh, on the counter threat teams, the reason this is a top priority for us us is that this lets us pull together every single piece of information from across DEA, from every investigation, every seizure, and it allows us to do it at a strategic level to do, if you think about targeting the entire network, which is the switch we've made, we need all that information to be pulled together so we can identify the key vulnerabilities mm -hmm. and now take this next step forward to share that information with the intelligence community and get to a point where you know we together can figure out what is the right way to dismantle these organizations. How is the agency planning to measure the success uh, of these new intelligence-driven initiatives? And what progress have we seen so far? So we measure success in a number of ways. We, uh, as I said, we have a weekly meeting where we hold ourselves accountable because uh, you can have the best plan, but if you're not executing on that plan, you're not gonna get something done. So we are actively looking at a number of things. First, of course, as I said earlier, the one number that matters and the one number we care about above all is American lives. In terms of our internal work, we measure a number of things, including um, how many active investigations we have. We right now have more than 2,000 against the two cartels. Um, how we're able to identify, how many members of those cartels we're able to identify, where leads are being sent, where prosecutions <coughs> are being done. And again, as we work across the entire network, we're tracking this in each part of the network. And that lets us say, okay, you know, how many operations do we have going on precursor chemicals? Do we have enough? Are there other ways we can bring them? So we're using the metrics really to drive us to work in a strategic way. Um, and then again, of course, we always measure, for example, the amount of fentanyl we've seized. Every single deadly dose off the street, we believe is a potential life saved. So we take that very seriously as well. I understand you're, you're conducting a review of your foreign operations that could lead to possible closures or relocations of certain foreign offices. Is that correct? So we, we had a foreign review report that came out about a year ago and had 17 different recommendations. We've taken on a number of those recommendations, including running a foreign footprint review. So for the first time in many years, we've asked the question, you know, where should DEA be? What is the threat posed to the United States from drugs coming from or through those countries? What is the risk uh, of operating in that region? And how much operational capability do we have? So that's ongoing. And we will make hard decisions at the end because we need to be in the countries that will allow us to be most effective to combat this threat. This uh, concludes today's hearing. Uh, we thank you for your service to the country. Thank you. Uh, and the fight that you're making uh, and, and one of the most important developments in our nation's history, that is the fentanyl uh, action that we talked about today. Um, so thank you for your service and thank you for doing a great job as the EA administrator. Tough chore. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cartwright, do you have anything to add? No further questions. Thank you for coming. Uh, 
And without objection, all members will have seven days to submit additional written questions for the witness or additional materials for the record. With that, the hearing is adjourned.